And hey, you know, good things sometimes come along that you weren't expecting. <laughs> However you got here, I'm glad you're here because we're going to hang out for about an hour or so. And we're going to talk about life and all the stuff that we deal with that falls into this whole arena of our relationships and our pains and aches and owies and getting better and improvement. And as I like to talk about with this group who are our regular listeners or viewers or whatever we call this, I don't, sometimes we call this a radio show, it's, but we're on the internet and we're not just audio, we're video, but some people listen on the podcast and it's, we don't know what to call this. I just like to think about that we're hanging out together. And when we hang out together, we talk about our tribe here that's developing this army, right? Against dysfunction. We're going to overcome dysfunction by developing our tribal, tribal, tribe, herd. I've heard two words on this. Let's call it the herd immunity because we're developing a tribe that's fighting the war against dysfunction. And the way you develop immunity against dysfunction is we get all of the parts of us cleaned up that stick to it, right? If you got a controlling person in your life and they try to put those messages on you, well, if you don't have any Velcro inside your head that that can stick to, then you can go, you know, take that somewhere else. But if it can trigger stuff in us, then we're kind of caught in it. Well, we can develop immunity, a good immune system. You know, the modern researchers call it resilience. You know, it'd be interesting to go through the decades to see all of the different terms that get popular. It's so fascinating to me, you know, having been been doing this thing in the field of psychology for a while now. Um, I am kind of turning into, uh, I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm not going to say I'm old, but I'm not. I've been doing this a while. And I've seen a lot of things, you know, um, come and go. And some things should go because they're stupid, stupid trends that have nothing to do with anything that makes things better. But the thing, there are a lot of things that stay that we know are transcendent and absolutely true. But it's interesting, they will take on new names and they kind of become trendy at the moment. But it's nothing new. You know, I think um, think emotional intelligence is one of those things. It's incredibly robust and powerful, but it was not new, but the name was new. I think we see now the term resilience, okay? All of those things that we used to talk about as ego functions and a bunch of other things. The reality is, and this is the great hopeful part for you and me, is that whatever we call these things at any given moment, the the realities of these things transcend the name, whatever name we call them. And that's good because what that means is that there are there are laws that govern our functioning and our well-being and those laws don't change they don't change they don't change over the centuries and the millennia it's always been true that if you're deeply connected in good, nurturing, nourishing relationships, you will be healthier. (laughs) You will be more resilient. You will have less clinical, relational performance problems than if we're emotionally isolated or disconnected or can't get our needs met anywhere. It's always been true that if you are not oppressed or abused or dominated or gaslighted or whatever you want to call what the bad stuff is that people do to people, it's always been true. That if that's not happening to you, you're going to be better off. And it's always been true that there are known ways of dealing with that. So that's what we do on this program is I try to take whatever we're talking about. And we like to think of this as a, as kind of a sort of an in vivo, in life, in real life kind of learning group, all of us together, both the callers and the listeners, um, as we go through these issues and we talk about them. That's what we do. So let me give you the number so you can call 844-940-2774, 844-940-2774, And uh, in the beginning of the program, while the calls are coming in, usually I like to talk about a little something that's on my mind or uh, I've run across in my work or the research. And 
It's interesting. Um, the one I want to talk about today, we, y- yesterday our team was, was all together. Um, and we were, you know, we're just doing a lot of things in our planning and in boundaries.me. If you haven't been to boundaries.me lately, guys, go over there and check it out. Go to the website, boundaries.me, because we have a lot of stuff, a lot of new stuff. It's just, um, you know, we're putting new stuff on there all the time. All sorts of, there's 80 something courses. The team told me yesterday we're up to over 400 videos on there now. It's like a world, a whole world that you can access by going to boundaries.me. But one of the things we were talking about was we have an event coming up on depression and that's February 17th. It's a two hour live event that I'll be doing talking about depression, what the causes are and what the cures are. And the reality is that while the, the experience of depression itself, the nature of the illness is hopelessness, right? When somebody's depressed, it's just like hope is, is just a very, very hard thing to feel. Feelings of hopelessness and despair and the future looks dark and all of that. And while that's the experience, the reality is, yes, that's true. That is what the illness is like. But the reality is that it's not hopeless. That we do know what to do in so many different ways, in so many instances about how depression is treatable. And, you know, people do very well and recover. So that's what that event's going to be about. So if you are um, experiencing depression or know somebody that is, or just want to make yourself more resilient against it, then join us. Go to boundaries.me forward slash depression. So that's the kind of like what we're up to. But I wanted to to share something because as a team and I were talking yesterday about this, we were talking about, you know, we got to get the word out about this event. And that led to a discussion about the event itself for some people is, it's kind of a, it's kind of a brown bagger. Do you know that term? That's from way back. Some of you may be way too young to know that term, but the brown bagger is what we would call anything that somebody like needed or wanted. Doesn't mean it's bad or good. Just it's something like you don't want people to see. It's like when somebody's drinking, they're not supposed to be drinking and they kind of put it in the little brown paper bag, right? Well, this is a brown bagger. Well, you know, if somebody's getting some medicine they don't want to see they covered up or if they're getting you know i don't know treatment for your warts or something i don't i don't know there's just stuff we brown back in life so no it's a modern day metaphor for the fig leaf right we cover up because we feel ashamed so we were talking about this that there is a just a stigma sometimes around depression that you don't find um, around other kinds of issues. You know, in fact, you go the, you know, celebrity tabloids, it's almost like, if you, you know, if you're in rehab for an addiction, that's like, you know, next to you got a new outfit almost. I mean, it's like, there's nothing. It's just another, it's another story. And I'm glad, I'm glad that it's normalized, you know, to get help. But it seems like, you know, you take a lot of this different stuff and it seems like depression kind of gets its own bad rap. And there's kind of a shame that surrounds it for some people. There's kind of a stigma that surrounds it, which we don't find a lot of times in other maladies that people experience. And so I want to spend a few minutes on that because, you know, it's really, really sad because one of the things that does do is that is that people's depression becomes the brown bagger. In other words, they they don't want to they want to let anybody really know that they're suffering in that way, and that leads to more isolation. It leads to not getting help. I saw some statistics yesterday that the num just in the youth of America, 
the the numbers of untreated depression are just going up and up and up and up and up and we can treat this we we you know we we know some things that we can do that help but but if people aren't talking about it and they're not sharing it and they're not kind of you know coming out coming out with it and admitting it it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything bad but there's a stigma and i think that there is a stigma you know underlying it all i think there's a human stigma that gets attached to this like like kind of come on snap out of it you know get up and get moving you know change your attitude you should be grateful and then there's there's the spiritual versions of that right there's new age versions there's christian versions i give you you know a lot of times you learn here christians will say well you know if you read your bible more if you prayed more if you did something more then you wouldn't be depressed in other words you know what really this is your fault is kind of the hidden message in there and it makes me want to scream we don't do that about diabetes See, well, there's a there's an interesting little comparison, right? A lot of times, depression has some significant biochemical things that are going on, where certain neurotransmitters are depleted in the brain, and the brain's an organ, just like the pancreas. But when somebody's insulin levels are off, which produces low energy, depression, confusion inability to concentrate we don't blame somebody for having a reactive pancreas or a fatigued pancreas insulin levels off why do we do it with depression and somehow it gets a stigma that you should be able to overcome this something's wrong with you and a lot of times in the faith world People say, well, you know, you know, you had your you had your spiritual act together, then you wouldn't be experiencing this. It's what they told Job. You know, think of the things they told Job when Job was depressed. They said, if you knew, it's like a walk through a Christian bookstore. It drives me crazy. Here's what the, the Job's friends told him, whom God got really mad at, right? He told the friends, you did not say what was true. What did they say? They said, well, if you if you if you knew his statutes more, in other words, you know, read your Bible more, Job. Of course, didn't have a printing press then, but same thing, right? It's your fault. If you had more faith, they told him. If you would put the sin far away from you, you wouldn't be experiencing this. If you would let your righteousness be your guard and your you know, sort of like your position. And they blamed him. They blamed the sufferer. And a lot of times that happens to people that are depressed. And this isn't just Christians. Let me give you the new age version of this. I was flabbergasted when this happened to me. Flabbergasted. I was doing a, uh, a special project with, with one of the big studios here. Okay, you're not gonna believe this. My mother died. A few weeks later, my father died. A few weeks later, fortunately, Finley didn't die. Hey, girl. For those of you who can't see the screen here, um, Finley just showed up. She's our our new Doberman who was like tiny, tiny back in when we got her in the summer and now she's about six feet tall anyway she just walked in and say hi to her and give her a little treat hey girl there say hi whoops dropped it okay so back to my story my mother dies a few weeks later my father dies like bam bam a few weeks later my brother-in-law who was like a brother to me who was a navy seal was unexpectedly 
suddenly killed in in battle in Iraq. All of this within a period of you know weeks. It was one of the hardest seasons that I ever went through for a lot of reasons. So about a month later, Morgan, I had this big, big project going with one of the studios. And a guy calls me from the studio and just, you know, working on the project. And he calls me and I had to talk to him a little bit because he was working in a different department. And he was one of the head guys over there. He said, so how's it going? I said, well, it's been pretty tough. I've, you know, had three deaths in the family recently. He said, what? And I said, my mother died, my father died, my brother-in-law, who I'm very close to, was killed. Yeah, here's what he said. And I said, so, you know, it's kind of a depressing season here. Here's what he said. He said, you know, you really should get in touch with how you're attracting all this death into your life. You know, like the law of attraction, right? So as you really start, start to think about it, how you're attracting all this death into your life. I had heard the Christian versions of this. I never had heard the new age versions. I've heard the secular versions, you know, the, the tough guy versions. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps versions. But I had never, I never had heard the, you know, like I'm attracting this. Anyway, I say all that to say, don't judge people that are depressed. If you are depressed, reach out. Talk to somebody. Tell your doctor. Tell your pastor, if he's a pastor or she's a pastor that actually understands. Tell somebody who's been depressed, go see a psychologist, go see a psychiatrist. Don't let the stigma do this to you. Hopefully our event, you know, if you come join our event, go to boundaries.me forward slash depression, two hour event, February 17th. Um, if you can't be there live, you can stream it afterwards. Hopefully that will go a long way in lifting some of the stigma for you or people you know. but. I just wanted to start with this because we were talking about it yesterday and the pain that people go through in not only being depressed, but feeling bad about being depressed. So come on, guys. If you're hurting, we want to help and other people want to help. Go to Facebook. I guarantee you on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram right now, I can't see it, but I guarantee you. I guarantee you there are people there that have been there and they know how you feel and they're posting right now. I can't see it. I'm going to go look at it later, but I guarantee you that's happening. And if they're not, I am. Because I've told you my story before. It started with deep depression. That's how I came to a deeper faith. And it's also how I ended up being a psychologist. But it's deep depression, really bad. So let's get rid of this stigma. All righty, 844-940-2774, 844-940-2774 is the number to call in. Um, and let's go talk to Cora, who's calling us um, from Las Vegas. Cora, welcome to the program. Hey, Dr. Cloud, thank you so much for taking my call. You're very um, welcome. So I am in a marital crisis. Um, my husband currently is struggling with addiction to gambling, and mm. I think it's also related to PTSD. So he's in recovery right now, but... Where, um, look, 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 let me get a there. few clarifying yeah. things here, if I can ask. The PTSD, where's that from? Uh-huh. Where, where, what? Um, he served. Was, was he military? He served in the military, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, it's from the military. He served for four years with the Marine Corps. Wow. 
Ah, uh, so brutal. So brutal. Mm. Okay, so PTSD yeah. and you said he's gambling? What's he doing there? Yeah, he, um, it kind of got worse over time, but we've been staying in Las Vegas for um, three years now, and it got to a point where um, we got evicted from our place, and so we had to separate, and that's mm. kind of what ended up in our situation now where we just can't live together, given um, how bad things are right now. So, mm. um He's getting help and he's actually right now in a program um, for veterans to get help. And I'm just Great. wondering if Great. there's other, yeah, if there's other boundaries that we need to put in place. Cause I've heard like extremes of not communicating and um, just like total um, a cutoff from the family. Yeah. But I don't think that's where we're at. Yeah. yeah. Where, where, where have you heard um, that? Yeah. Where, where have you heard that? Where, where's that coming from? Um, there are some books that I've been reading. Um, am I allowed to put names out there? <laughs> um, I don't care. <laughs> but like David E. You say, I read this really, I read this really bad book. It's by this Dr. Cloud <laughs> guy. You, you know, you can say that. I don't no, care. No, no, no. Not <laughs> I, <from> I, <laughs> it might be. <laughs> What, 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 go, go ahead. Um, I was mostly reading from David E. Clark's um, books, Enough is Enough. And um, there's this other woman who, uh, they're both Christians, as they claim, but then they both kind of give steps to how to separate in certain situations. But I just don't feel like our situation is fitting in that mm. category where we have to completely excommunicate you know so yeah. Um, yeah i don't know the books i don't know the yeah. books but the i mean it's the principle that if somebody's got an addiction or somebody's in recovery that you 100 percent all the time go dark um it's mostly for like um marital problems that have to deal with um like but you always you, or affairs you always go like dark you don't talk is that kind of the yeah that's sort what of in, they recommend well yeah the, i don't know the it. books i don't know the books but okay. um but but let me tell you sort of the lay of the land here a lot of times you know if situations are different the illness is not mm -hmm. for the most part i mean we understand you know what what to do with addictions right we know the process we know the ingredients we you know we know what to do with ptsd we know what to do with marital crises but that's a toolbox right and so there are mm -hmm. times there are times when a total you know a a total blackout can be a very 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 correct and good tool to use and different phases and different mm -hmm. seasons of the the path of recovery sometimes yeah but there are other times when no 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 no, no. we really want to see both of you together along with the other treatment that's going on you know a lot of times most treatment centers if you look into those they're going to have family groups Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to have, mm -hmm. have, have couples groups that the, you know, the spouses should be in their own kind of element of this. So, so it's mm -hmm. not, my, the answer is, I don't know the situation well enough. Um, but I do know that in some mm -hmm. instances, um, some instances, that's a good idea. And a lot of instances, it's not, it just depends. There's, mm -hmm. there's too many factors. So, so if that's your question, right. um, I would want somebody wise who has done this 5,000 times, you know, helping you guys and figuring out what's the best strategy for you. And there are some times when, you know, what, what we're looking at here, the bottom line is what increases the, uh, 
what would be the word to use here? Well, broadly speaking, what what increases the forces of healing? Right? And sometimes sometimes deprivation can increase the forces of healing if the person has patterns where contact to any one person, it could be a spouse, could be a parent, could be who knows. Sometimes that contact contact goes into an entire internal system that actually kind of gets them uh, in a little bit of a false medicated scenario and it doesn't it won't let things get down to where they're really hitting bottom. Sometimes it's actually mm-hmm. part of the medicine that they can connect to to disengage from the stuff they shouldn't be attached to. And I, I get way technical about this, but the bottom line is, yeah. if the question is, do you always have a blackout? Not always, in my opinion. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, that definitely helps. Um, well, I mean, what, what are the doctors also saying? Asking is, and it's not really doctors. We um, have a very strong connection with our church, so we um there's no doctor involved in the ptsd um no Uh, i'd really want that for you so he so so yeah sorry he's not labeled or diagnosed with ptsd we are just he's the one who threw that term out there that that's what he thinks he has and that's related to the gambling but he's never been clinically diagnosed well, he's got clinical issues going on. So I would mm-hmm. want him to see a clinician as well as, I mean, pa- you know, as well as a pastor. We do a lot of stuff with pastors and churches, a lot mm-hmm. of my program, Churches at Heal. If you go to churches at heal.com, mm-hmm. maybe you can suggest that mm-hmm. to your church or pastor. But, but look, if the guy's got, any symptoms that look like PTSD and he's got an identifiable cause for it. I mean, he's been in, he's been at war and we know that that (laughs) that's kind of one of the places you get this, right? I'd want him to get some good, good clinical help. Mm. And And, so as a wife, and I'm telling you that that, I'm telling you that as a church person, (laughs) <laughs> I'm, not, I'm uh-huh. not telling you that as a secularist, right? I'm telling you that as a Jesus uh-huh. follower, and I've written a lot of books about mm-hmm. that have Bible verses in them. So I'm not like coming from nowhere in this. I'm not anti-faith. Mm-hmm. Faith's got to be a big part of this. But there are the tricky part of this is there are a lot of spiritual principles that are right throughout the New Testament that is exactly what happens in a good clinical environment and oftentimes does not happen in some spiritual environments because they will do sometimes, I'm not talking about yours, I don't know anything about it, but sometimes churches will sort of like, you're going to pray this away, right? You you know, you just need to read the Bible, you know, all of this kind of, you know, religious activities and spiritual disciplines that don't do the healing that the scriptures actually talk about. So I don't know what's going on. I'd want him to see mm-hmm. a good. So in answer to your question, blackout is not always the mm-hmm. answer. It sometimes is for a season for mm-hmm. very good and specific reasons, but also I'd want him to get some treatment. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you so that much. It? That clears up a lot. Yeah, go yeah. go to churches go go to churches that heal dot com, and 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 check okay. out that program. Uh, I'm writing that down. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Alrighty. Dr. Club. Thank you for your call. I don't know, um, you know, I don't know all the particulars there. It sort of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, sometimes there's a a stigma. You know, it's not just churches that tell people, and I am not talking about that particular church. I don't know this church. I'm talking about the concept, okay? She might have, he might have the best church in the world coming alongside him. I hope he does. But some churches, I mean, I have, you know, (laughs) over the years, um, a lot of churches that hate me. You know, you can find all sorts of, you don't hear it as much anymore. It's not so anti-psychology. But like I would be the worst person ever. In fact, <laughs> one time 
this is <laughs> unbelievable story. One time, uh, one time I got a call at two in the morning from the nurses station at at one of <laughs> the hospital units where <laughs> where I was a <laughs> clinical director. Two in the morning. I go, Dr. Cloud, you got to get to the hospital right now. I said, why? Well, 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 I'm like trying to wake up. Because the the the, the special forces have invaded the hospital and, and they're trying to kidnap one of the patients. And I go, what? And literally, literally, this church had organized <laughs> like a special ops group. And they broke in through the emergency or came in through the emergency room and went to the psych unit and they were gonna gonna rescue one of my patients <laughs> from the secular humanist, <laughs> which was me. <laughs> right now, I promise you, she voluntarily sought out her services. She was doing very well. She was <laughs> she was it was fine, except this church thought clinical treatment is bad. Well, I'm not painting all churches like that. I do so much, so much work and have for decades with churches. I mean, I go to the website, churchesatheal.com. It's a big church program I have. I love church. I speak in churches. I support churches. I write materials for churches. Go churches. I mean, I'm really on board here. But there are some of them that are anti-treatment, and that's just uh, well, you can read my books and see what I think about that. But it's not just the Christians. This is what we were talking about earlier. It's not just the Christians. I mean, you got you got celebrities. You've got sometimes you know all sorts of people that are they're anti medication. They're anti treatment. They're you know, it's just goofy. So it is a, look, denial doesn't come in only a choir robe. <laughs> it, it comes in a lot of different uniforms. It comes in business suits. It comes in aprons. It, I mean, it could be your grandmother. It could be your grandfather. It could be, you know, ah, don't get me started. I'm pro-treatment, okay? If somebody's doing really good things to help somebody, let's support that. All righty. Uh, Sabi is calling from Hungary, our first international caller of the day. Sabi, did I pronounce your name correctly? Hello. Hello. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, Welcome to can the you program. hear me? I can hear you. Oh. What time is Thanks it? Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's almost 8 p.m. Almost 8 p.m. Okay. Well, good. We're not in the yep, yep. middle of the night. So, so after 8 p.m., I can go out. It's forbidden to go out after 8. Ah, ah, got it. Okay. Well, how can I help you? Thank you for your call. We're always glad to have our interna first international caller of the day. I wish I could give you a prize, but... Oh, thank you. I can just congratulate oh. you. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. How can I help yeah, you? Yeah, uh, well, I had a... Yeah, for uh, like more than a year ago, I had a, I had a short relationship, and uh, how short? After the breakup, uh, three months. Three months. Okay. Uh, three or three and a half, something like that. Uh, after the breakup, uh, for like four, almost four months, she, she was calling me every week. And um, no way, I want to say you broke left. up, you had a three month relationship, and then were you broken up for four months? And then she started calling? No, uh, we broke up, and after the breakup, after she, the breakup. she called me for four months. Like we broke up at the end of the September until January, okay. she called me almost every Okay, and uh, when she called you, my problem is that I well. Like, how am I doing? What am I doing? Just kind of checking of in. Skin. Just kind of wanted to talk. Yeah. 
I don't know. Uh, my problem is that, uh, like, I remember uh, I uh, keep in mind these my milestones. Last year in January uh, was uh, our last call, I think. Um, I asked for what are you doing? Uh, sorry? When, when she was calling you in these four months, was it just... Did it stay at that level? How are you doing? Or was it like innuendo, you and me, kind of like any kind of like you and her stuff? Or was it just, you know, getting the news? Uh, well, uh, from my side, it, I, I, always, I was always hoping that, okay, she's no, calling I know me, maybe, maybe. Yeah, but was she, <laughs> okay. was she giving you double messages, anything confusing in there, or was she just kind of checking in? Uh, I remember uh, there was a Which, call. Which, by the way, is a double I'm message. I'm not letting her off the hook there, but I'm just trying to find out how how toxic it was. Well, like, uh, for example, uh, once she said that um, you speak so beautiful um, and, uh, oh, it's, it's too bad that it didn't work out. And it's uh, how sad it is that we can't be together. Uh, I don't know. Is this a double message? Oh, you think? <laughs> yeah, that's that's. I don't know. Oh, it's, it's a double funny. message. I, I, I'm not saying she meant it that way, but if if I'm you, and she just, you know, re rejected me, right? But now she's calling me back. We broke up. Right. And she's the one that did this. And then she's calling me and she's saying good things about me and good things about us. At the same time, saying we're not together, I don't want to be with you. That is a double message. How can I not get hooked by that? So I'm feeling for you here. Okay. So last year uh, in January, I would have given, her, time, a, I would have given I think, her a dial tone. I would have said, "Well, if you if you like so much about me, then either come back and we'll work this out, or you broke up with me. Go have a nice life." But I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep talking and you saying how great we were and we should have made it and this that and the other and you like me. And you you not be with me that hurts too much. I'm going to move on with my life unless you want to be with me. If you want to be with me, come on. But if not, lose my number. Oh, uh, well. By I I'm I'm the one who feels uh, I'm I feel like a loser, and uh, I have to admit this was my first let's say serious girlfriend. Yeah, I never had before. I'm sorry, man. Well, she didn't make it any easier. I tell you. I'm sorry you feel like a loser, but she did not make it easier. But so what, what is I your question last now? Year, this time, what can I do? I keep uh, looking at her Facebook profile. I keep looking oh. if she's online. I'm thinking, shall I write oh. to her? Shall I? I want to, but I'm not doing it. No, 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 no. I keep no. looking she's... at her school. No. Why would you do that? I'm not scolding you, but I'm saying, what would be a good reason for doing that? She's she's moved on. You hadn't talked to her now for a year. If she wanted a relationship, she knows where to find you. But she hasn't in a year, right? Yeah, well, uh, last year in January, she said that she's, she started dating someone and um, the guy sometimes sleeps at her. She said this on the phone. The guy sometimes what? The guy sometimes sleeps at her at her house. Sleeps at. I her assume house. he is not. The guy is not sleeping in her uh, guest room. Okay. But so what? Get. Let's get to the question. Um, so how how can I help? Uh, well, uh, how can I? Uh, what else I have to do to um, give up this habit of stalking her? I'm, I think I'm stalking her. I'm looking after her. I'm, yeah. Well, of course. What? 
Look, what else? Look, let, let, let's take the. Um, I, I, I'm going to give you a path here. First of all, I want you to hear me on this. I really, I really feel for you. This is a very, very, uh, it's a very hard situation to be in. You know, after, you know, a breakup and she moves on and then she kind of keeps you sort of having hope and you kind of get conditioned into maybe, 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 and it doesn't work. And then that gets that whole thing going. And I feel for you. I, I, I don't, I don't like what she did based on what I've heard here, but here's the deal. Let's take it out of the stalking category and I'm going to give you a term for this. So, because it'll become actionable to you. All right. It's not, you know, when you say, how can I get away from this stalking thing? I would put it this way. What you're calling stalking is you're, you're hanging on to hope to ward off or help you defend against the grief. See, when we lose somebody, then there's a lot of predictable, you've heard of the stages of grief, well, they're always not so linear, but there are a handful of things that happen. So one of the things that happens when we lose somebody, our immediate, you know, after the denial, the shock, we go into some combination of what's called protest or and bargaining. If you ever seen like a movie when somebody first first dies and the doctor tells a loved one what immediately happens. Have you ever seen that, Savi? Uh no, no. So you'll see it in lots in lots of scenes or in real life that they'll tell somebody, I'm sorry I've got some bad news, you know, he didn't make it. Immediately, what do you see? No! There's a scream of no, this can't be. No. And that is the scream of pain of grief. And everybody who's ever lost anyone, there's a protest that comes up because it what humans were not designed to lose each other. That wasn't part of God's plan. And so we've got a part of ourselves that wants to fight that, right? So you protest it. And then you got another part that we want to bargain. We want to cut a deal with this loss so it doesn't happen. Well, what if I change this? What if I were smarter? What if I were prettier? What if I were, you know, and we, if I only did this, if I only behaved this way, then maybe she or he would like me. Yeah. And we, and you get into this. Yeah, you felt that. Are running in my head. Exactly. Yeah. Look, that's part of the grief. All right. So yeah, but it's more than a year, and she she has somebody. I don't have anybody. It's like it's I tough. understand. I, I understand. I understand. Let me get finished here. But as long as you're engaging, right? Facebook, looking, thinking about her, all this, then you're not going into the into the real stages or the work of grief of letting go. So. I think here's what you got to do. You don't have anybody to date right now. And that's, that's fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think now's the time to be dating anybody anyway, because I think you got some, some work to do in letting go of her. But I think what you've got to do is you got to find a really, really, really good counselor. I would have one person that I go to and a few friends to support you. And know what you're going through here. They're going to help you let go and probably a good like grief group or even divorce recovery group. Go to my, my boundaries.me page and go to boundaries.me forward slash recovery. And there's a divorce recovery kind of, you know, workshop in there or something like that where you learn about the steps. But the reason, one of the reasons you can't let go of her is this kind of hope thing that's going on, but also You've got to have something to fall into. See, we can't let go. It's like a trapeze. You can't grieve something unless we fall into and have somebody to hold on to. And instead of a rebound relationship, you want a support relationship that's a healing relationship. So I would want you to find that 
and get with them and say, I've got to start letting go. Help me let go. And that's what I think would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, well, um, in spring, I um, started um, working with a counselor, but she gave birth to a kid and we couldn't okay, continue. Well, then, then we got to find another at, at, at our first. Well, um, well, she asked uh, what happened. Why did we broke up? I, I said a few information about uh, my ex-girlfriend and she said that um, every road leads to Rome. Like uh, this wouldn't have worked out. Um, that woman has many uh, connection, uh, connecting issues or What's uh, the point bounding though? issues. What, yeah. what is the point? In terms of today, what you got to do today, what you got to do today is what I said, I think. That's my opinion. I think you need to get some help to help you stop the, and we'll call this cyclical behavior of checking in, checking in, checking in. That's just kind of like a compulsion that wards off the pain, right? Yeah. So that's that's my that's my opinion. Get some help. I'm sorry that counselor didn't work out, but I think you need to find one and you need some support and you need to kind of educate yourself on grief and letting go because you got, you know, you're vibrant, you're young, I guess you sound young. Um, you know, I'm you, 33. 33, you're a child. <laughs> you're so young. You have oh. a whole life ahead of you. I'm, I'm a little bit delayed with everything. Uh, like no. she was my first girlfriend. Why? Well, that's one okay. of the reasons, you know, the, what, what is that? The first cut is the deepest, you know, they, they sing songs about this. This is so look, I, I got to talk to some other people, but I don't want you hung up on her for longer than yesterday. But to do that, you got to find some help to let go. And I want to say this and th thank you for your call, by the way. And I hope you find that that help soon and an individual counselor, a couple of friends to support you in this, who know what you're going through and you tell them, you got to help me let go here. And then maybe a grief group as well. Um, so here's, here's what I wanted to say about that for, for the rest of you. Remember, just think about this. This is like, I mean, it's, 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 it's profoundly simple. All right. Grief and moving on from a loss is, by definition, a loss, which means a letting go of something. All right. If we're going to move on, we have to let go of the past. I didn't say deny it. I didn't say don't deal with it. I didn't say don't think about it. I said, let go of it. All right. God has designed a process for letting go. And we know how this works. But think about this. If I'm holding on to someone or a dream or something, and there's no future in that, and I got to let go of it. If I let go, watch me here, guys. Watch, watch, watch. I'm letting go. I'm letting go. I'm falling. I'm falling. I'm falling. Oh, my chair caught me. And now, look at this. I'm sitting in the chair. It's holding me up. Look at my hands. While my hands are letting go of what I was holding or who I was holding on to. And I don't have to hold on. Why? Because I'm holding on to the chair? No. Because the chair is holding me. So when you hear me say, if you guys got to let go of something, you got to land somewhere in a support system. 
that understands what you're going through and helps you metabolize that. I'm talking about one that holds you so you don't have to hold on because you got to let go. And when you stop holding on, that's the only time the tears can come. That's when we move from protest and bargaining and bargaining to weeping and sadness and the sponge gets squeezed over and over until there's no more tears and things start to change. But it can't happen till we let go. And you can't let go until there's somebody to catch you. And after they catch you, you can't let go if you're having to hold on. You can only let go if they're holding you up. So that's why you'll hear me over and over and over talk about if you've got to let go of something or move through an injury or let go of the past or whatever, we got to land somewhere for it to work. Okay. I hope that uh, is helpful to you. Um, let's see. Uh, where are we? And uh, Ann, Ann from Pennsylvania is calling us. Uh, welcome to the program, Ann. Hi, Dr. Cloud. Thank you for taking Hi. my call. You're very welcome. How can I help you? Yes. Um, bear with me. I'm trying to get the question out. Um, <laughs> I just, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> trying to Let me guess. One thing. Let me guess. What's the question? Okay. Remember, you're too young. Remember Karnak? Johnny Carson used uh, to. He, he'd hold yes, his forehead. My mom loved Johnny Carson. He was the best. It's like he's a mind reader. Uh, <laughs> and he would give the answer, and then Ed McMahon would read the question. Anyway, walk okay. back in time. Um, what, what is the question? I just started setting boundaries. Actually, my body did. That makes hmm. sense. Um, that makes perfect happened. perfect. I wish more people would hear you say that. If you don't set boundaries, <laughs> your body will do it for you. Oh no! Oh, and I, can I go. I've been up for three <laughs> days. I can keep going. I, and then you collapse, right? Your body will do this. It, it did, and that's kind of what happened. It just one day just did it, and I was like, "Oh my goodness!" <laughs> but um, the problem. Well, I have friends who are always trying to help me set boundaries. And um, <laughs> I finally did. My body did. <laughs> and why is and, it so obvious to your friends? What are they, what are they looking <laughs> at that makes all these friends always trying to get you? What, are they, what behavior are they watching? People pleasing and uh, just my self-worth. A lot of things. There's a lot of stuff. You've talked about depression, PTSD. And mm. I have anxiety. There's a lot of things. And uh, I have a great support system of amazing friends who are believers. And I need that, my faith in the Lord and, and seeing my identity through him and believing that too. Yeah. But I'm having a hard time with the boundaries I've set, keeping them. When do you, finding? I'm finding a need to rush back in because that's Give the me. way I am. Um, feeling hurt that I did that to somebody. Feeling bad. Oh. When when is it? When when do you resolve a boundary that was a hard set? When do you resolve one that was a hard set? Give me. You mean when do you remove it? Um, I guess. Yeah, maybe. I guess start communication um, directly with them. Um, I'm not sure. Well, it depends on the if context. It's healthy but let, right now for me. Let 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 me give you a. I'm gonna give you a little um, analogy here. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you walk outside, and it's raining cats and dogs. Okay. Mm-hmm. Or hailing. You live in you live in Pennsylvania. You guys have weather back there. We don't have any in California, <laughs> so I have to remember what this is like. <laughs> But you walk outside and it's raining cats and dogs, right? Yes. What do you do? Yes. You set a boundary, which means 
you say, I can't stop the rain, but I can limit the rain's behavior on how it affects me. So what do you do? You set a boundary. You put an umbrella over your head. And so you have protected yourself from the rain drenching you. Okay. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. A friend's already said this. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> when do it. you Thank remove, you. when do you, this is what you just asked me. When do you remove the mm -hmm. boundary? When it stops raining. <laughs> Cats and dogs, or when it's the heavy rain. <laughs> the heavy rain? I don't want to get wet at all. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. hang with me. I'm not taking mm -hmm. the, I'm not moving, <coughs> excuse me. I'm not removing the umbrella off my head until it stops raining. Right? Okay. You with me? Right. Yes, I am. So you take the boundary off of you when it's not needed anymore. Now don't hang up yet. <laughs> if you're out, if you're out and about, you're shopping that day and you're going store to store, you're living your life and it stops raining, you take the umbrella down and you kind of put it under your arm, right? Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. throw it away? Do you put it no. in the trunk of the car? Do you leave it at home? No. When do you do that? Because of the weather? Yeah, when do you do that? When You do it when there's blue skies and no danger anymore. So there's really kind of three phases to this. I, I, if I need a boundary, I need a boundary. It's raining. The guy or the woman or the, whoever is, they're hurting me, so I'm going to limit that. I can't make them stop, but I can limit my exposure to it. Okay. And then after mm -hmm. it stops, I can remove the boundary, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw it away because I don't really know if it's safe yet until there's a proven track record of blue skies. And then I'm going to put it in the trunk until I need it again. Okay. What if you looked at it like That's that? Awesome. Yes, and I need to visualize. I'm a visual person, so you just totally oh, helped cool. me. <laughs> Thank cool. you. All right. Yeah. I wish I knew the specifics because I bet it's really interesting because you're, you know, oh. I can tell you're bright, you're engaging, you're interpersonal, you got a lot of friends, and somebody's somebody's played a trick on you, haven't they? I... I, I, I don't know. I just, it's, it's, I'm trying to figure things out and for healthy for them, healthy for me. And because I love them, you know, uh, they're great. And is person. it hard? Is and, it hard to say that they've done some not okay things? Is it hard to appropriately blame it them? Is. For, I've not, yeah. yeah, I've not said it just, in the past. I've just taken it and let you it just be did said it. and casual. Yeah, you yeah. just did it with you just but did it with me hard. though. It hurt. Did you wait a minute? Did you notice that? I said I think, and mm -hmm. I'm guessing, and I'm just a guess. Mm -hmm. Not a dumb guess, but just a guess. I said I bet somebody's kind of played, and you didn't say, "Yeah, he has." Is it he or she or she has? I shouldn't okay. say. It's it's yeah, a, no, yeah, it's okay, not a he. Fine. It's a she. That's but, fine. That's yeah. fine. Okay, whoever it is. You said, well, there's just a lot of things. So I'm just saying, it might be hard for you. It doesn't mean you're not loving when you require somebody else oh, to I own their that. behavior. Yeah. So, but it doesn't mean you're great not loving. Great friend. It doesn't mean you're not loving if you require her to own her behavior. You're not bad for that. You're not mean for that. You're not unloving for that. In fact, you are trustworthy for that. I just, I guess I have my, we were talking about self-esteem and worth and I pray for others. I don't pray for myself and I'm learning friends seeing this good friends that can read me very well are knowing my self-worth and it's, it's hard. And I, that's where yeah. I just feel like it's really hard. There's a lot of PTSD, anxiety in my past it's and I'm going too, through a lot of personal stuff. It's too much yeah. right now. I just can't take what's being put at. And I just, my body did it. And I was like, there oh my go. goodness, I can't believe that did it. 
it, I there can't believe go. that happened. It was a very harsh thing for me to do. And I was like, wow. And I felt very sick about it. But I mm. had to focus on the moment for me, what I need to get through. And it's, it's hard. It's so hard. Well. Hence, boundaries.me, I am joining. <laughs> I need oh, it. Good. I need to work on this. I'm glad. Can you hear me, though, in saying that it's really good to take care of yourself when, when it goes past a point to where um, your body's breaking down? I mean, that's telling you something and your friends are telling you. So here's one more voice that um, it's good to take care of yourself. That's not a bad thing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your call. Thank you so much. Thank you for your call. Thank you. Thank you for You know, um, a lot of times, that's such a good, uh, it's such a good metaphor, the body. It's more than a metaphor. It's a reality. But it is a metaphor. I think, are y'all watching this? If you can see me, see that right there? Finley just come up, came up and slobbered on me. I didn't see that. Anyway, um, when your body, look, your body, your body has a limit. And a boundary is a limit. Your heart has a limit. Your mind has a limit, how much it can take. <laughs> Your soul has, look, we are finite, okay? We're finite. God's the only infinite being. <laughs> we, you know, if you look at the original definition of a boundary, it's a property line. And your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that's you. And it's large and it's deep and it's expansive and it's wonderful, but it has a limit. And if you take more than you can take, it's going to break down. You're going to feel it. And so that's why sometimes listen to your body. You get that little tension there in your neck. Well, what boundary am I not setting that's letting my body body talk to me like that you need to listen 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 to our bodies listen to our bodies we had a team meeting yesterday i don't know how long we thought it was going to go <laughs> but we were we were there i think like i'm going to guess uh i don't know from uh, it had to be like 10 hours on a Zoom call, roughly, something like that. And this morning, I realized when I went to physical therapy, she goes, and I'm working on my knee, right? She goes, what, what did you do to your back? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, what have you been sitting too long? I said, well, I sat in one spot for 10 hours yesterday. She goes, are you crazy? Okay, so she goes, you've got to set some, you got to set some limits. She goes, after an hour, you got to take a 10-minute break and get up and walk. And I said, oh, boundaries. Oh, okay. Well, she, you know, my body was talking to me. So your emotions will do that. Your body will do that. Your fatigue will do that. How you feel, your senses, your intuition. There's a lot of places. Listen to yourself. You know, one of my favorite verses in Hebrews, it says, it says solid food is for the mature who through practice have learned, have had their senses trained. You go through enough situations, your senses get trained to discern good from evil, whether it's good to keep going or bad to keep going, whether this person is good or they're not good for me. Your senses have to be trained to be in touch with them and be in touch with your feelings and your body, your spirit, your heart, your mind, your soul, and it will talk to you. Now, it doesn't mean that it's perfect. Sometimes we get false negatives, right? We get a sense that somebody's dangerous when they're really not. You know, we're getting triggered. 
sometimes you get false positives and think somebody's good for us and they're not. We're idealizing or in denial. That's why it says through practice, get your senses trained. Got to get our senses trained. Okay. Uh, we're about out of time, but I want to go to Anne. Um, it, no, wait a minute. I'm, I was wrong about that. Where did uh, uh, I lost? Um, it's Tracy I wanted to go to before we got off because um, she's been on hold a while. Tracy, welcome to the program. Hi, welcome. I think, thank you, Dr. Cloud. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, okay, I got you. Okay, great. Um, so and, I and, 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 and can, can, can I say something, uh, uh, Tracy, because I said I was going to go to Ann, and I don't know if Ann is still holding or not. I don't know if we'll have time to get to Ann or not. Um, but Ann, I want to let you know, if we don't, call us back. But Tracy's been on hold for a long time. And I just want to make sure I got to her. So Tracy, I'm sorry. How, how can I help you? I, I try to be quick to know at the end. Um, it's okay. I just wanted some... Um, some advice from you um, for my 18 year old daughter who has in the last uh, three weeks um, been around when a suicide was found of a friend of hers. Oh, so it was kind of a, a traumatic event um, oh my gosh, for the family. Yes. She's very close to the family. Yeah. She's very, very close to the family. So she's spent a lot of time with them. They're working hard on healing their good, good family, good faith. Um, but you know, you just wonder as a mom of an 18 year old, she's, she's been to counseling before, so she knows that's an option. Um, oh, and she, you know, so she'll know that that's something she could do, but I guess as, a, as her mom and like trying to let her be, become the adult, she's, what am I might be looking for? Um, and also mm -hmm. it, just to, to help her through the trauma, but also to, um, look for, um, a possible like trauma bond that she might be making between this. It was her boyfriend's family. So um, I guess I just want her to be aware of at that age. Um, was it her, was it her boyfriend? Up. Was it her boyfriend? That suicided? It was her boyfriend's family. No, it's her, his, his brother. His brother. And so is he still mm -hmm. her, he and she are still together, the boyfriend. Yes. Yes. Okay. They're very good friends, you know, very, very good friends and very, very deep friendship. Um, good. Okay. And it's just, you know, they're both going to college, different colleges, you know, so it's just a time in their life when you, it was um, not sure what was going to happen next for them, you know, before yeah. any of this. And now that she's oh been gosh. through this, it's just as an outsider, I kind of see her doing some, you know, just some kind of real bonding um, that I just want it to be healthy for her. Um, yeah. Is there any part of it that looks unhealthy? Um, a little codependency right now, but it's only been a couple of weeks. Um, what does codependency mean? But just spending a ton of time together, perhaps like putting a little thing, some things on, on hold right now in order to be together. Uh, you mean it's more like, Which might, can we call it, can, can we call it kind of fusion instead of, codependency it's yeah, not like she's a little bit of she's not really yeah, enabling bad yeah. behavior right no like no she, not at she's all kind of fact, she's helping she's helping yeah just kind of helping okay. and really kind of being part of the healing it looks to me like a healing process and i guess i just want to know when yeah, is I it wouldn't... a look good and when does it not you know yeah well i think that and she i she knows she could go to a therapist, but she hasn't asked for one. He is looking into one, and maybe she will eventually. Like I said, she's I would keep, seen one before, I just so keep, that wouldn't be unusual. Yeah, I would just keep the conversation alive about, okay. you know, and, and I would also encourage her. I said, look, you know, your boyfriend and the family has gone through something terrible here, and mm -hmm. you're, being, you're being a help to them. You know, you're you're kind of the next rung of support, but mm -hmm. sweetheart, you've gone through something terrible here too, right? And so, I think part of the conversation is to help her understand. Yeah, it 
it did happen to that family and it happened to you. And so Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure that, how are you doing? And just talk to her. How are you doing? How's it feeling? How are you processing this? And, and, Mm -hmm. you know, do you want to go talk to somebody? And I just kind of, I'd kind of keep it alive. And then, Uh okay. Just, just keep asking. And then I would, what I, that, you know, you say, is there unhealthy? And the only thing unhealthy there would be is if they're going through it in an unhealthy way, which it doesn't sound like, but no, not that I um, know of, Mm -hmm. but unhealthy would be is after some period of time, if the rest of the world disappeared, the rest of her world, she disengaged from, Mm -hmm. and then you're calling a trauma bond. What, you know, she's just in this where it would be unhealthy for her to not have a life that's, that's, larger than the trauma and just the family. And so I would, I'd kind of watch for a disengagement and look at the three big areas you hear me talk about all the time, you know, clinically is, is she depressed? Is she withdrawn? Is her energy level go down? Is she kind of not doing well in her studies and she can't concentrate in her sleep Mm -hmm. and her appetite, all that all that sort of stuff, or does she go the opposite way? You know, she kind of have a manic okay. defense against this. And then relationships, okay. are any of her relationships disturbed by this? Is she pulling out of some and getting or having, you know, is it affecting re- key relationships? And then does her performance mm-hmm. kind of dwindle in some way? So just okay. just watch her. But this watch is a hard can. thing. Okay. And she's, and my mm-hmm. hunch is she's very fortunate to have a mother that's observant so keep the lines open keep talking to her and say look remember this happened to you too and maybe you want to go talk to somebody okay thank you okay thank you all right thank you very much thank you for your call um well i tipped my hat a little bit there and we're over time but i can't not go to ann she's been holding after i said she's been holding so ann welcome Welcome to the program. Maybe she's not holding anymore. Did we lose Anne? Okay. I thought. Um, All righty. Cool. Anne. There we go. Well, we are at the end of our time here. Um, one more day. And it's good to be with you guys, as always. Let me give you a couple of reminders. Go to boundaries.me. Check it out. We've got a lot of material there to do what? To come alongside you. Come alongside you. Because you might be finding it difficult in some area. Might be finding it difficult in some area of life where you're not feeling like you want to feel, but you don't know how to kind of get moving more anxious than you want to feel more stressed than you want to feel or more depressed or more maybe your outlook's changing or there's some habit pattern you you know don't quite know what to do with or some relationship that you can't solve and you just don't have an answer to or some goal you want to reach and you don't know how well boundaries.me is a place that will come alongside you and give you a lot of information of the dynamics that go into all those and how to resolve them. And even a path, you know, some of it is going to help you identify that maybe you need, you know, to get some other help. Who knows? But you can go in there and find out. It's my way of coming alongside you in those areas of life and going through it with you. So go check it out. Boundaries.me is the place to go. And We've talked about depression several times today. Boundaries.me forward slash depression. If you are experiencing depression or know somebody that is, then this is a two-hour workshop. It's coming up on February 17th. And we're going to talk about how does depression get resolved. Boundaries.me forward slash depression. Okay, guys, um, I will see you tomorrow. Um, I think we're at our kind of regular time here. It changes every now and then when I have different stuff. Um, Let me look at this. You know what? I think... uh, 
Yep. I think we're at the regular time tomorrow. I'll see you then. 10 a.m. Pacific right here. Bye-bye.